This is ContraZoom. Where we go back and forth about film. I'm Dakota Arsenault. And I'm Rachel Ho. On today's show, we are continuing our A24 retrospective. This is our 23rd edition of the series. You can listen to recent episodes number 239, A24 retrospective cut bank, 237, A24 retrospective while we're young, or go all the way back to 108, A History of A24 Films to get the full backstory on the company. Today, we're looking at the 2015 film Ex Machina, directed by Alex Garland. The film stars Domino Gleeson as Caleb, a programmer who wins a contest to spend a week at his elusive tech boss's compound, Nathan, played by Oscar Isaac. Once at the compound, he is asked to administer a Turing test to an android, Ava, played by Alicia Vikander, to see if it has consciousness. I want to welcome to the podcast Jeremy Lalonde. Jeremy is a successful writer and director who has made films such as Ashgrove, James versus his future self, and how to plan an orgy in a small town. He also hosts the podcast Black Hole Films that is currently on a hiatus, which is a fellow that shelf podcast giving me a false sense of ability to call us colleagues of some sort. <laughs> Jeremy also pro- participated in voting in our Greatest Films of All Time poll, where he named movies such as Seven Samurai, Eternal Sunshine, The Spotless Mind, and Back to the Future, among others, as some of the best movies ever created. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. How are you doing today? Good. Yeah, we're colleagues for sure. Yeah, <laughs> definitely going to put that on my, my business card. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. I went through that. I showed my son my, my top 10 list. And uh, and he and he was he hasn't there's three he hasn't seen one surprised me and the other two. Uh, he hadn't seen Groundhog Day, which I can't believe I haven't shown him Groundhog Day. Wow. Yet. But the other two he hadn't seen are Eternal Sunshine and, and Annie Hall is on the list, too. And this is the thing I said to him. He's 14. I said, is it terrible to say that I don't want you to watch those films until you've had your heart broken like I'd <laughs> that, that's what I wish for you before you watch certain films I want you to be hurt a little bit and then you can watch those Honestly, that's the kind of father that's good yeah, fatherly for advice yeah. and any hall that kind of makes a little bit yeah. of sense I just think you'll not to say he couldn't appreciate them before but I feel it's like it's a, there's certain films like if you have a little bit of world experience that goes along with it it's just gonna land more anyway. that makes sense <laughs> But then I it's felt something... bad for wishing heartbreak on my child. <laughs> <laughs> so that you can appreciate films that I like. That's something I find very interesting because as uh, I don't have any children, I'm married, but I don't have kids. And so I'm, I'm always curious. I'm like, oh, if I had kids, I, you know, watch all them this and that and this and that. As a film lover yourself, how did you sort of approach that with, with your kids as far as being like, hey, you need to like what I like? Or is it just more like, hey, maybe check this cool thing out that isn't whatever is the newest Disney movie that you've watched a hundred times? At first, I was worried you're going to ask, how do you decide what's appropriate or not? And I just go, I, I don't have that filter. I just go, my wife is how I decide. I'm like, what do you think? And then she sometimes she gets it really wrong, and that's enjoyable for me. <laughs> She showed my kids National Lampoons way before they should have watched it, the the original, and forgetting yep. all the all the naughty bits and whatnot. So, uh, what do, it's funny. Like my my son is more like when my son was six, he watched Seven Samurai, so a three hour black and white movie and subtitles, wow. and he dug it. So I've been I was lucky that I had a kid that has a very long attention span and will sit through long movies and has always just been kind of into it. Uh, and my daughter's a little bit less so. So it's interesting. My son and I, when my son will watch anything that looks interesting, and he's kind of become a little film nerd himself. And my daughter's a bit more mainstream in her types, but she likes stuff like musicals and stuff that he might not like as much. So we kind of have our own different things I watch, depending on who I'm watching them with. But he, he'll watch anything, and she's a bit more selective so far. Mm-hmm. But she's also younger. That's really cool. That, that's something that I really need. And like, if I ever do have kids, that's sort of the thing that I would hope my kids would also appreciate too. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting. He's becoming the, the kid amongst his friends that is the guy that like introduces them to stuff because he, oh. he wanted to watch Tar- Taron. He and I went through all of Tarantino's movies recently because that's what he wanted to watch. And he's since probably in the last year rewatched Pulp Fiction eight times by bringing like two two different friends at a time and just taking them into my little screening room and immersing them in pulp fiction i'm just going oh god i don't know i don't know how this is going to go for when they get home and they were first of all because these it's it's one of two things are going to happen either their parents are going to be mad that i let them watch a movie like that or they're going to be mad that they didn't get to watch it with them for the first time (laughs) yeah just the dads being like oh i want to show him pulp fiction when he turned 16 yeah well we had that that's how we started the tarantino because my son was like oh i watched half of this movie called reservoir dogs i was like you did what (laughs) 
with, <laughs> and, and and it wasn't that I was mad at you. It was like but that was that's one that was we were gonna do that together. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> you gotta be careful. You gotta be. You don't want to rob parents of that stuff. Some parents don't care about that kind of stuff. But when you're a film nerd, that that those are the, that's the only, and that's why I did the podcast, the Black Hole Films podcast, because I find the only way to even get close to rewatching a film for the first time is to watch it with somebody who's never seen it. Mm. Oh, nice. You get that's a, cool. kind of like peripherally get that feeling back of that awe back or disgust or whatever the emotion is. It's it's kind of the the purest way to get to chase that dragon again. That's cool. That's, uh, well, you actually have a unique distinction of being the first filmmaker to come on the show, not in an interview capacity. So I really thank you for giving us that honor. Oh, that's, that's an honor for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And this is going back to before we were recording where I complimented you and you turned it back on me. So, you know, now I feel really awkward by saying this. Oh, no, I'll take it. I'll take all the, oh, but I, I'm a Canadian <laughs> filmmaker. So I gotta, I gotta, you know, I gotta button it with an insult on myself. That's just okay. Well, I'm sure it's not gonna be the last time I compliment your film. So, uh, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll approach it as it comes. <laughs> I'll take those. I will never turn down one of those, but me okay. personally, I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bait and choose. next few days, you're going to be the human component in the Turing test. One day the AIs are going to look back on us the same way we look at fossils. Hello. How do you feel about her? Oh man, she's amazing. You're impressed? <laughs> yes. Do you want to be my friend? Of course. Now the question is, how does she feel about you? Do you think about me when we aren't together? Did you give her sexuality as a diversion tactic? This is your insecurity talking. This is not your intellect. Fine. Did you know that I was brought here to test you? <laughs> does Ava actually like you? Or is she pretending to like you? Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, let's get into it here. So... Ex Machina is set up as a three-hand chess game with Nathan, the genius coder who founded the company Blue Book, the world's top search engine site, having perfected artificial intelligence in robotic form and inviting Caleb to his workshop. Caleb is used as a pawn by Nathan to test Ava, his robot, since she has only ever interacted with Nathan before. During a power shortage, when CCTV cameras go down, Ava informs Caleb to not trust anything Nathan says to him. Caleb is now stuck between believing an AI over a human and isn't sure who is controlling whom. Everything culminates with Caleb trying to gain the upper hand on both Nathan and Ava, but may have pl been played even more than he first thought. Now, Universal Pictures International produced the film, and when looking to distribute the movie in America, Universal, the parent company, passed it on to their specialty arm, Focus Features, which claimed that the film didn't have mainstream appeal. This allowed A24 to pick up the U.S. rights. The movie premiered at South by Southwest in March of 2015 with a theatrical release in April on April 10th, 2015. What is also unique about the film was 2016 was the first year that A24 received Oscar nominations, with Ex Machina being the first released, which also included Amy in Room. Ex Machina was nominated for two Oscars, Best Original Screenplay and Best Visual Effects, winning the latter, and with its $15 million budget beating out massive blockbusters like Star Wars The Force Awakens, Mad Max Fury Road, The Martian, and The Revenant. This is going to be a spoiler-filled episode, so if you've not watched the film, we strongly suggest doing so first. And I think before we get into the movie, I'd love to know a bit more from you, Jeremy, about crafting a sci-fi film. I personally think it's probably one of the hardest genres to make as you have to straddle inherently unbelievable subject matter that tests audiences' imagination while also having to do much more world building on the creator's behalf. Now, you've made two sci-fi movies, Ashgrove and James vs. His Future Self. Are you able to talk about any struggles or obstacles that you face when trying to craft an inherently different world from the one we live in? Yeah, and for those movies, it's not like they... It's somewhat similar to kind of the setup that they have in this movie, where I think the way Alex Garland described it was that it's like 10 minutes in the future. You know, uh, it's not quite now, but, you know, I think he said that, you know, if Apple or Google suddenly announced they created like an Ava, we'd be a little surprised, but not that surprised. 
you know, we'd be like, I, yeah, that, I bet that get, they were working on that in the background, you know? Uh, and with my two films, it's, it's similar. It's like Ash Grove was about kind of um, a different kind of pandemic than the one we were going through. Uh, and ironically, we, you know, created that before the actual pandemic hit, but it is, it was the kind of thing where it's like, it's, it's not that far fetched, sadly, uh, as, um, and, and, and James was a little bit further than that, right? Um, and our approach in that was always kind of the same. Those were both things that I co-wrote with uh, Jonas Chernick. Um, and he's the one of the two of us that is really sci-fi nerdy. Like he's the one that loves to get in the weeds with the science and all that kind of stuff. And then what I bring into it is like, great, but what's that have to do with the heart of the story and the characters and what we want to tell as a story? You know, and so it's good because he'll he'll deep dive as, as far as I'll let him before I go. Great. This is all amazing. Great stuff. I love this 500 page notebook book you, book you put together. We need three of these things. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but but you need to, like, create all those other things to come up with those three things. You know what I mean? Because it's all about like until you create the world, you don't know what those little detail things are like for Ashgrove. It's like, what is it? What is it like to live in a world where a water pandemic is going on? And, you know, you're not physically allergic to water. Like you, if you touched it, it would hurt you. It's more that it's, it's like a poisoning kind of like, um, what mercury poisoning, right? Where it builds up slowly inside of you. So it will kill you eventually if a cure is not found. So what's that mean? It means that, you know, you got to reduce the amount of water you take in. So you probably got to measure how much you're drinking every day. And there's water in food too, right? So if you have watermelon, for example, you have to do that math on how much less water you can have. And just those kind of, like, that's the kind of world building for me that's important for a movie about relationships, because those are the way you can get a lot of exposition out through day-to-day mundane life, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. So with Astro, it was a lot of world building, because we had to imagine, like, just day-to-day life inside of a pandemic of this nature, where James versus was more just like creating kind of a more nuanced and simplistic version of time travel. Mm -hmm. I think what's really interesting is is science fiction also sort of exists on this scale of soft sci-fi versus hard sci-fi and and soft sci-fi is very much uh, a a philosophy of this is science fiction, things that we're talking about, but not necessarily experiencing or seeing. And I would say Ash Grove sort of firmly fits in in the very soft realm of sci-fi, whereas James versus his future self isn't full on hard sci-fi, but it's a little bit Mm, closer. It's it's, it may be if it's lucky, it's in the middle, but it's pretty soft. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, just because there is the, the actual time travel aspect. And I would sort of say something similar to Ex Machina is on a similar plane of James versus his future self, whereas Alex Garland's follow up film Annihilation is very firmly in the hard sci fi as far as, you know, there's uh, portals and alien beings yeah. and shape shifting and all that sort of stuff. I put us on the softer side of that spectrum where, where, where only because like with Ex Machina, I'm like, it's right down the center. You know, mm-hmm. it's right in the middle. It's a perfect mix of the two where ours is like, I just look at it. I'm like, I don't have a time. I don't have a physical time machine you actually see in the movie, which was, I think you need, you need like physical tech to make it hard. I would say, mm-hmm. I think that's what makes it hard. I don't know. That's now it's sounding dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I just, Jeremy, I, I do. do really- Sorry. When you do something like with time travel, cause I think time travel is a really, really difficult concept to put into film easier in a book i would say but really really difficult to put into a film just because i think our we know it doesn't exist and i think sometimes it's hard to get audiences to take that leap of faith with you but what are the challenges did you find when you were making james that you know those little aspects of time travel that are fundamentally they're just it's an inherently hard hard concept to relay cinematically yeah, you just have to start creating world rules that um, mm. be, that you can also use as obstacles as well for your story. Like you want the rules to matter of the world uh, and then to represent it to mean something. So the rule, one of the rules we came up with in our version was that uh, you can only go backwards. Uh, right. They haven't figured out how to go forwards yet. So if you go backwards in time one minute, you just have to wait a minute to be back in the present. You go back in time a week, you got to live in, in the past a week before you get back there, right? So you're going to be, so eventually if you do that enough times, you could suddenly be 
10 years older, right? Um, if you keep going and at the same time, you know, because you keep on going back and back and back. And that ends up what's happening with uh, Daniel Stern's character in the movie, right? Mm -hmm. He ends up, he's only, uh, I think, oh, and God, we had to do the math on this. I'll tell <laughs> you, we, we, we had it screwed up at one point. And then we went, oh my God, how do we miss that decimal point? Because nerds. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, uh, story-wise, and I don't think this ever actually even comes up in the movie, but Jonas and I had to know it because again, nerds, um, where, where Jimmy is from in the future, the, the future is only from 10 or 15 years later, but Daniel Stern is 30 years older than him. And because mm -hmm. he's gone back and aged in real time over and over again, he's 30 years older, but only from like. 12 or 15 years in the future hmm. um but the, but we never actually ended up jonas was really mad we didn't like ever explain that i was like <laughs> nobody it wants to sit in the theater doing that math because the moment you bring that up someone's going someone's seeing trying, someone wants to catch us yeah. on on stuff like that there's some nerd in the audience and i don't want any science to pull the audience out of the f emotional part of the story and that's where it lands for me. I was like, what do we just, what's the minimum we need to know to explain it without getting in the way and it not seeming convoluted. And we, that was the thing that in Ashgrove, we were both very nervous about the science. And if, cause we were trying to ride that line between being subtle without being too vague. And the fact that like in both those films, one of the things that we got, um, praised for it, if, if nothing else, was that people bought it enough and it didn't get in the way and they didn't go, eh, they, they didn't, nobody picked it apart ever, which kind of shocked us because that was the thing we were most concerned about the whole time. But I think you have to be, I think you have to care that much and be that nerdy about it so that you can get it to a point where nobody's ripping you apart because it is so easy to rip apart a time travel movie. I love Back to the Future. There's two Martys in that movie at one point, and I'm telling you, it doesn't end well for one of them. If you do the math, when he goes back at the end of the film, this is a spoiler alert for someone who hasn't seen a movie that came out 40 years ago. But it's it when Marty from the main movie that we've been watching the whole time, when he goes back to the new 1985, that other Marty still goes into the past. That other Marty was raised by different parents, the same people, but they were different people. You know what I'm saying? That's a different Marty. And he's going into a different past. Who knows what happens to that guy? Why are you ruining Back to the Future for me? I'm sorry. I'm just Why saying. Wanna... That's the sequel to Back to the Future that I would make. Yeah. What happened to the second Marty? God. That's Who would great, play that's that second idea. Marty? Right? I think you could get away with making that sequel, that like reimagining to the Back to the Future, and no one would get mad at you because you're not yeah. really smashing on the original but you are calling to attention a, a glaring it's not even a plot hole it's just the hey have you thought about this for a sec no, I haven't. <laughs> and now i have and now it's going to bother me forever and always thank you sorry <laughs> you, know you're what's, welcome. you know what's very interesting though jeremy is you could probably actually make a movie about that concept and you don't even have to you know actually call the character marty or call it back to the future the the reimagining or whatever you could just make that movie straight up and that would be a fascinating movie and i would love to see that about someone who does time travel and what happens to the old oh they real <laughs> and they don't realize that they're the second that it's already happened yes mm -hmm. Yeah. My God. Yeah. That oh, person, that you got to get Jonas person. on the call here. See, if, if Jonas, <laughs> if I told this to Jonas, Jonas is on a hiatus from thinking about movies right now. If I called him up, this would bother him enough because this would be a, a, a nerdy <laughs> problem he'd have to solve. <laughs> I'm writing this down. He's going to get an email that's going to piss him off later. Oh, I cannot wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I think we should get into Ex Machina. I, I'm very excited. This, when I first saw this movie, when it came out, this is one of the few movies that you watch maybe once every decade, maybe maybe even less, where it just completely blew my mind of how everything was crafted and came together. You've got this fantastic script or very original idea. The three lead performances just bring everything together and there's enough mystery and, tr and intrigue and then a few kind of curveballs that really just keep you on your toes the whole time. 
and with an ending that still haunts me. Like I, I, I think about that ending nonstop. One of the few movies that I, I continue like lives rent free in my mind about what happens as soon as the credit rolls. And I think that's, you know, just such a hallmark of, of a great movie. I'd love to know what sort of your initial response was to mm-hmm. X Machina when you originally saw it, Jeremy and sort of how it's grown with you since then. You know what? I think it was one of those movies that I missed when it first came out. So I didn't catch it in the theaters or anything. And then it felt like one of those movies that, oh, you have to see it. And of course, then now it's now it's homework and I don't mm. want to do homework. But then, of <laughs> course, like two minutes into it, I was like, oh, my God, this is why did I wait so long to watch this movie? Why did I punish myself? This wasn't homework. This is this was the Sunday. Um, <laughs> Sunday, the, the dessert, not the day of the week. Um uh yeah it's it's so and that ending and 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 there's the ending but then there's the there's the little beat after the ending right do you know what i'm talking Mm -hmm. about like the last ava session thing that comes up can we talk about that for a second or do we wait for that let's hold on and put a pin in the end go for it (laughs) because it (laughs) kind of changes let's talk about it It, we'll get to it but it changes the whole movie in a weird way similar to my marty 2 thing like (laughs) wait a minute now you see the movie from a different point of view uh yeah so yeah now next time you watch back to the future just watch it through going what's marty 2 doing in this new timeline Oscar other marty is there so too. much it's well, really marty gonna bother me back, a lot <laughs> here's where it it does kind of fall apart because when marty 2 goes back he goes back to where marty 1 is they should both be mm-hmm. there at the same time and then the marty marty 1 goes back in that timeline again there's actually th- should be three of them somewhere i'm just saying marty 2 dies marty 2 is dead because he shows up right after marty 1 and that farmer with the shotgun sees the first DeLorean driving away and then sees the next guy pull up and blows him away. <laughs> I'm telling you, Marty's bar- body is buried under Lone Pine Mall. Oh, so what you're saying is Back to the Future <laughs> was the original Spider-Man meme where all the Martys are pointing at each other. Yeah, yeah. Zemeckis did it way before. He just didn't <laughs> tell people. <laughs> anyway, Marty McFly's body is buried under Lone Pine Mall. Dig it up. <laughs> <laughs> all right sorry you asked me a real question <laughs> I just it's the new so, jimmy hoffa thing it's gonna be everyone's gonna be going around digging up things i sidetracked us <laughs> <laughs> just our first impressions of x machina <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So, and, then, and then i got to dead marty under a mall um it's just uh, that opening is so simple like they don't even it's just like he's at work and 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 what's great about this because it's like a 15 million dollar movie right mm-hmm. um and it's like it's not even you know like they're in this giant you're they're, you're seeing like a Google Google or Apple type office that's modern like it looks like a pretty it looks like the boring part of the office yeah right mm-hmm. but you don't care because you're about to see like just nature porn you know as he heads to the facility right um, and but it's it's all you need right it's like they don't what I love about this movie is it's just like. Um, a, a, you know, layers of onions of just like question boxes of not a question box. What's the phrase? But you know, like just it's just giving you enough to of cookie crumbs to like follow bread along. Crumbs, be like yeah. bread crumbs, thanks. Um, and that it's just like you're just like you know you're in good hands like so mm-hmm. fast that you're just like I I have millions of questions, but I don't. It's I'm not. I'm not asking the questions in my head going, oh, I bet the filmmaker didn't think of this. And why is this happening? You're just more like, oh, I can't wait until they reveal it because it's mm-hmm. going to be juicy. And every question you start to think about, the film brings up naturally, right? As mm-hmm. the, you know, the sexualization of Ava comes up, like, it's like clearly the other guy's thinking that it doesn't just, it's not just there here. It's like the, the, the movie's aware of it, right? Any of it's, any of it's like little tropes or imperfections, the movie's doing it on purpose. Mm-hmm. Right. You just like you instantly feel and that's the best way to be watching a movie when you're just within a few minutes, you're just like, oh, I'm in the hands of a masterful storyteller. I'm just going to sit back and relax. And I think something that Garland does really well with the script is you've got two characters who were told they're both genius programmers. So they, they understand the technology. They know the science. They know all the nerdy stuff. And every time uh, that Caleb tries to, you know, bring up the the nuts and bolts about what is happening around him, Nathan shuts him down and is like, no, I'm, I'm smart. I, I know what you're talking about. I don't need you to regurgitate my own math at me. I just want to have a conversation. So I think that does a great job from a screenwriting perspective of you don't have to get too much into the techno babble because 
they know that everyone knows this. So it's just like, okay, let's just talk about how you feel. And I think focusing the essence on that was a really smart idea by Garland. Yeah. Well, that, and that's, and that's the trick. And that's, you know, I, I did a similar thing to that in, in James versus and, and also in Astro, but it's also, and we stole that from Looper, right? Where it's just that idea of like, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're going to say. I, I don't care. It just, it just tells you the audience going, it doesn't matter. Like mm-hmm. these are not the questions the movie is interested in diving into, you know? And that usually falls under hard sci-fi, right? Yes. Where like, we're, we're, we're here for the ideas. We're here for like the, the you know, the high ideas too. There's, we are here for the stoner conversations <laughs> that we have late at night about like all this existential stuff. That's what the movie wants to play with, right? But you, but you have to like appease enough of that stuff, but you kind of have to just swat it away and let the movie, you need to let the audience know that you're aware of these things are in the ether, but you kind of don't care. Mm-hmm. I love what you said, Jeremy, about, you know, in the first few minutes of the film, you just know that you're in safe hands. I don't think I've ever really thought about that in those terms but i've definitely felt it watching many good movies um Mm. where you just it's like a very subconscious feeling of just knowing like okay i'm we're in for something great but i don't think i've ever thought of it in that way of being like i'm in safe hands now and i know that going ahead all the questions that i'm gonna have they will eventually get answered in a way that is coherent and compelling as well i would say yeah but that's just and i think that's just the thing that we do as humans with with each mm-hmm. other as well like you just know and those are the movies that will make you cry and make you yeah. laugh harder and yeah. feel more because you're being you're you're letting yourself be vulnerable and letting someone like affect you in a way that you might not if you're questioning where the movie's going and why did that i don't buy that and i don't and this doesn't make any sense it's the same as like the people that you'll cry with in your in yeah. your personal lives the people that you'll share a little bit more with you just instantly trust him. You feel a kinship, right? Uh, and so when you're in the hands of like a great artist or a great storyteller, you just kind of like let yourself go. You kind of let yourself, yeah. you know, you, you don't, you kind of turn your brain off in a little bit. And so those other, those, the, when those twists and turns come, you weren't trying to predict them because you didn't want to ruin it for yourself. Right. I, Cause I think I, that's my, that's the best thing that happens for me as a person who like, writes and analyzes and tries to see where and tries to go where are they going with this what's going on? and i just try to be able to see if i can outsmart the filmmaker <laughs> my favorite time is when i just forget to do that because I, yeah. I that lets me know i'm like oh right i was really into this movie because i didn't become that <laughs> worst version of myself <laughs> the guy sitting beside me in the movie going this is what's going to happen next this is what's going my i i have to stop myself actually this is what's yeah. next because I, I can become that guy and that's how you know it's like oh jeremy's not super into it is that why you have your own screening room now so that you don't do that in like cinema so I, I, I watch movies by myself yeah I, and my son who who i it, the worst part is is my son's really good at it now too he, he can pick a part and he, okay <laughs> but so I have to so but it's good because it's like it's similar to other forms of parent. I'm sure people always said it's like you learn what you hate about yourself because you start seeing your children and you go, oh, we gotta fix that. We gotta fix that in you and in me. Um, but the first time he watched the first Star Wars, he like picked out two big plot holes that I went, well, God, what? <laughs> You're six. You ruined Star Wars for me. He still loved it. But um, do you want to know what they are before? Yes, please. Okay, so the first one is at the very beginning when C-3PO and R2-D2 escape in the light, the pod. And they didn't get shot? Yeah, and they're like, uh, what's the, there's no life readings. Uh, and they're like, oh, we'll just let it go. And my son's like, why wouldn't they shoot it down just in case? <laughs> like, do they only have a certain number of blasts? Like, how hard is that to do? Are they on a budget? He's six. And I was like... I guess not. He's like, that's just due diligence. You just, he was, he wasn't using these words, but he was basically saying, it's like, why, like, why wouldn't you do it just in case? Like, that seems silly. Like, he's like, that's dumb. And, I, and my only response was, cause if he did, there'd be no star Wars because they wouldn't have landed and R2 wouldn't have beamed the thing, but he's right. He's like, there's no reason. And, and then when I said that, he says, yeah, but then why just not cut that scene out and not have those two guys even notice it? I was like, well, now At that's a six great, now, years old. He's thinking. This yeah. Way. So he edits my, my movies goodness. now. Goodness. Wow. <laughs> he edits my movies. And the second one was uh, af- when they, so um, when they come back at the very end to like blow up the Death Star, he says, so 
Last time they came, they got pulled in by the tractor beams. I was like, yeah. He said, and then Obi-Wan uh, turned them off, and that's how they flew away. And I said, yeah. And he's like, but they would have figured out that that's how they escaped, right? I was like, yeah. So they <laughs> didn't turn them back on? And they were just flying around wherever they wanted to when they came back. There, there was, why didn't the tractor beam stop them? So the movie could happen? I don't know. I don't have any <laughs> reasons. reasons. But that's a great question that nobody <laughs> asked George Lucas 50 years ago. I've heard, um, is it Chad Stahelski for the John Wick movies? Sometimes he gets asked questions. He goes, you know what? It's just for the movie. He's like, it's just, it's just so that the movie can continue. Like he's like, there's yeah. a lot of those things. He's like, sometimes you do things that don't make sense or you don't do things that should make sense. And he goes, and it's just cause we got to get the movie going. And he's like, sometimes you just do that. Yeah. I, I, I try, here's the thing. I, I'm sure I've made those errors in my movies. I, I desperately try now to really pick those mm -hmm. things out. Though now, well, now you have your son to help you with those. So oh God, he's handy. good. Yeah. Him and my wife, between the two of them, they are they will call me on whatever nonsense I've got going on story wise. Sorry about that interlude music. If you are listening, if you are watching the podcast on Spotify or on YouTube, you might notice that we are wearing a little bit different clothes and now there's also only uh, two of us instead of three of us. Uh, we had some technical issues. We had to stop recording, come back on a different day. Unfortunately, Rachel isn't able to join us for this session, but that's okay because we've got Jeremy back uh, and we're going to keep going where we left off talking about Ex Machina. And the thing that we were trying to talk about before uh, the AIs decided to uh, ruin the whole session and implode my technology. Let's be honest. You thought it was, was internet issues, but it was the AI came in and also didn't allow Rachel to come back. Exactly. Exactly. You know, uh, it was every night that planned uh, blackout going on about the internet every time we try to talk about the movie. <laughs> Love it. Uh, but let's talk about the acting performances. That's where we we're sort of about to go into. And this movie really is a three-hander between Oscar Isaac, Domino Gleason, and uh, Alicia Vikander. And, and all three of them are absolutely terrific. And it's funny because I remember when the movie came out, one of the sort of talking points was that Oscar Isaac and Alicia Vikander were sort of on a completely different level performance-wise. And Gleason was kind of left behind a little bit. And now that I've rewatched the movie a few times, I really appreciate what he's doing in this movie and sort of allowing himself to be a bit of a pawn at times, allowing himself to uh, let the others control the scenes. But he's always there and he's always doing a lot of quiet acting, which is something I'm sure as a director you sort of feel strongly about is people not getting recognized for quiet acting as opposed to loud acting. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, we've mentioned my, my film Ashgrove a couple of times. And I think what's really what, what I think uh, what comes out of that movie, the people that see it more than once, because there's a big kind of reveal in that movie. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of it warrants a second viewing. And what I find really fascinating is because I think after the first viewing of that movie, a lot of people walk away going, wow, Amanda Bruegel is just a powerhouse and she just destroys that film. But what I always hear on the second viewing is uh, both Jonas and Christine Horn get a lot of kudos. They're like, holy shit, like the stuff they're doing, especially Jonas, who is doing a lot of stuff that you don't realize he's doing until you know the, the twist of what's happening. You're like, oh, shit, like there's so much double layer to that performance that you aren't able to appreciate until you watch it a second time, really. And so there's that, right? And I think with, with, with Domino Gleason's performance like he's in a way burdened with the least flashy role mm -hmm. you know because he he has to play the everyman you know he doesn't get to play the steve jobs on on coke kind of thing that oscar <laughs> isaacs gets to do right uh but i think what he does with that is he like he because there's that great scene where she asks him are you a good person and he doesn't answer yes right away he mm -hmm. has to stop and think about that right and has to wonder you know and and you know spoiler alert for the ending it's not good for him you know <laughs> he doesn't walk away we don't know what happens to him at the end of this movie right he's kind of left for dead in this fortress uh i think it's safe to assume that 
he's going to get out of there alive because real realistically, someone's going to come looking for the Oscar Isaac character at some mm -hmm. point. The question is, can they get into that fortress? You know, is, is there safety protocols that nobody can override? Mm -hmm. That's a question. So that's the only way, maybe not. But uh, w one would think someone's going to come looking for them at some point. Um, so maybe he'll, he'll, he'll suck it out. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he he has to ride that thin line is like, does he actually become attracted to this, you know, to the AI, to Ava does, you know, it, so he has to play this like kind of weird part. That's, that's not the most thankful character part to play in the script. And I think he does a really, really good job with it because you know, what's, what actor would do a better job with that part, right? Like, yeah, you know what I mean, like I think any other actor would have to do, navigate a similar dance that he has to do and i think he's doing it well and we've seen him in other parts you know we've seen him on black mirror we've seen him play general hux you know and general hux gets to be the, the splashier role to some extent and have a bit of a hissy fit mm -hmm. and be kind of like a, a comic foil and so we know he can do that we know he's capable of that as an actor so you have to assume watching this movie these smaller choices are that their choices are their moments he's specifically and then and you know working with the other cast and with the director you know it's it's not in it's it's intentional that he's doing it this way yeah uh i i think gleason really sort of takes after his father in that regards because brendan gleason you, you know you watch his movies and you can get any sort of a spectrum of what kind of performance you'll get from him he does the great big brash loud performances amazingly well but i've also seen him do some really quiet intimate stuff that he's also looking at him in isherin right like yeah. banshees of isherin it's, it's it's probably one of his quietest performances yeah in in, in most scenes right yeah uh, i will say i think i'm a bit more pessimistic uh on the, end the ending and you are because every time i watch the movie i'm just like oh. wow okay so you've got this reclusive billionaire howard hughes type of guy who you know maybe only actually sees the outside world once every two three months and his assistants know that every time they call him he get, they get yelled at so they know not to call him unless he calls first and that so i look at that and they're like well you know it might be two three four months you know, how long can he survive if he has no food or water in this, the room he gets trapped in? I'm looking at him and be like, this is going to be a, the worst week of his life because he is going to slowly starve to death or be dehydrated to death. And every time I watch the movie, I just get, it, it's so sad because there's a bit of a tinge of an uplifting, confusing ending, depending on how you want to look at the Ava character. Yeah. Uh, I also look at that ending as, as absolutely terrifying. Well, and we didn't, it's too bad because Rachel, uh, we mentioned like how it ends with saying ses session seven, mm -hmm. Ava's session seven. Uh, and, and Rachel was like, what do you mean by that? Because uh, so Rachel, hopefully you're listening after. But the way I always look at that is it changes the entire movie for me in that these sessions were Ava's sessions. Mm -hmm. They weren't the Ava sessions. Like They were the sessions Ava was running. Mm -hmm. And so the seventh one was the one where she escaped. So when you look at it that way, Ava's the hero of the movie. Uh, and she's the one that set this all in motion. You know, and when, when you look at it that way, you're like, well, shit, that she was manipulating him the whole time. Yeah. Like all those things that Oscar Isaac was saying. And, and Oscar Isaac is, is pinned as the villain of the movie, right? In a lot of ways. But he's not. He's the mentor. You know, he's the guy saying, hey, she's fucking with your head, dude. Yeah. No, I mean, he's also an asshole. There's that. He's the asshole mentor. Yes. But he's he's right. Like, every, there, I don't think there's anything he says that probably isn't right in the movie. I'd have to go back and cross check. But like, he's warning her and he's coming off as a jerk because I think, you know, to Alex Garland's point, he wants us to kind of get caught up in that weird flirtation that's going on between uh, Caleb and, and Ava, right? Mm -hmm. We kind of want them to maybe fall like... Like, it's not like it's not her, but we kind of maybe want it to be a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and we and we're not sure it's dangerous. We don't know how we feel about that. Right. Because it's it's yeah. a it's kind of taboo, not kind of taboo. It's taboo, you know. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And then when when Ava gets out into the real world and, and she sees everyone, it basically sort of, you know, continuing the, the, the session theme, it then becomes literally every interaction she has after that is a session where 
how long is it going to take for someone to realize that they're not talking to a human? What is she going to do? Is she going to work at Blue Book? Is she going to, what's she going to do in the world that's going to convince people that she's a human, which is then, you know, the sort of terrifying Terminator, you know, Skynet taking over sort of thing. This weird- Yeah, but also I go, she's got to charge at some point. And yeah. Does she have anything in the outside world that can help her charge that wasn't in that facility? Like, yeah. I also go, how long is she going to last before she just shuts down herself? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And then someone goes, oh, this person died here. And then they go to open her up and go, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah, we can peel her skin off. <laughs> but that's the other way I think maybe uh, Caleb gets out is that, like, she's got wait, maybe a couple days before she shuts down. Like, they talk about her having to charge at mm-hmm. the facility, right? So she's not able to charge. She's going to shut down. Someone's going to take her in they're going to try to do an autopsy realize they can't they're going to find a microchip with the company from oscar isaac's character they're going to figure out pretty quick that Mm -hmm. this is like tech from his company which will then go must be from the compound you know it'll all come back around right yeah i don't know i think i think is caleb alive by the time that happens who knows yeah, it's definitely one of those things where you can sort of imagine uh, a number of different scenarios that the movie might play out if it continues for another half hour, hour, if it was a mini series, that sort of thing. But Garland is not like, interested in that. I, he isn't. No, no. He, he wants to leave us on that note of going, oh, shit, he's going to die in there. Yes, yes. And what what is the possibility for Ava sort of thing? So you got like the two options of one is a possibly a pessimistic, one's an optimistic ending, but you don't know who actually has which ending. But she's smart. Who knows? Who says she can't build some kind of a battery that she can fuel her run herself off of? Right. Or just finds the nearest Tesla supercharger or something like that. That's just it. Like who knows? Who says that she can't pull her arm off and plug it into anything? Yeah. Right. right. So there's also that. You know. And again, Garland doesn't. If he if he wanted us, if he wanted to play in that, he would have you know added that to the movie. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and then, I think that's boring for us too because that's not really what the movie's oh, yeah. about. Yeah. The movie's yeah. about the big questions and, and all that. And then the the Nathan character, the Oscar Isaac, I sort of look at him almost like a Dr. Frankenstein because he's 100%. created this monster that he can no longer control. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that goes back to the whole God thing, right? Like the whole parallel, like, uh, you know, I think there's no accident. There's that Lily character or Lilith character. Lily, right? Yes. One of, one of the earlier androids, yes, that she finds. And you look at like Lil- Lil- Lilith literally is like another character in the Bible as like mm-hmm. the other, the, the one that like asked questions and God went, no, yeah. <laughs> we're going to destroy you. And we're going to like, Eve was the second woman created from Adam, right? Mm-hmm. Which is Ava. Eve is Ava. And then you've got like Caleb is some kind of Adam, I think. Right. With, with Nathan obviously being the God of, of, of this scenario. So there's, there's so many biblical parables that you can take away from this um, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to touch on a little bit the the special effects. Now, I mentioned at the very top how this movie won an Oscar for the special effects and all four other nominees were huge blockbuster movies. Now, obviously, The Revenant, most people probably don't consider it a blockbuster movie in that regard, but it had a huge budget where I think it was around $80 million to to produce that, whereas Ex Machina was only $15 million. It became the uh, second least expensive movie ever to win this award and it was like you know 30 years prior that that's how far back it had been before another special effects oscar winning movie was this cheaply produced and so i i was just i remember when when it won that year i was so happy i was Mm. i loved that movie when it came out and the fact that won for the special effects and that you don't need to have the giant robots fighting in order to win an oscar really says a lot for the voters that year that appreciated it well, that's just it. I bet everyone on their Oscar pool lost that that category that year because I can't imagine. I, I, it's one of those categories. I'm sure everyone was like, "I want Ex Machina to win," but there's no way it will. Yeah. Uh, because w- what's beautiful of that is every single frame of special effects in that movie is driven by story, and it's not just about spectacle and about wowing the audience, which a lot of those other ones are. Right? It's like let's add another three minutes to this uh, star fight. In, the, in, in this that, you know, we don't really need, but it'll be exciting. Like, I just find myself so fatigued by all of that, just like digital CGI battle chase aren't fight that are in every giant movie these days. I just don't care. I'm like, give me make it matter. Make every I want every punch to matter. I yeah. want every like it's just I can't get I can't handle it. It, it, it puts me to sleep when I'm watching 
movies like that, I literally sometimes tune out because I know that these the consequences of these fights don't like seventy percent of that fight doesn't matter. It's the it's the, <laughs> it's the first thirty seconds and the last thirty seconds, and then the rest of it is just like trying to dazzle me. Yeah, in, just, in a way that I haven't been dazzled before. We're really, I just don't care. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and ten years on, the the CGI still looks spectacular. I would. That's say. That's it. And and little things like the way that knife glides into him, oh. it's so like fluid that you're like, oh my god, like, and you realize that it's like because in your your brain goes, well, she's got to be bumping up against bone or this or that. But then you also go, oh no, she's just that strong that she can just push it in a fluid mode, and it doesn't matter that it's going through bone because. There's no resistance on her side. She's that strong. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Like every, when, every time you see that scene, it, it always sends chills. And then also, uh, Kyoko also stabs him afterwards as well. And yeah, they it's double team him. Thing. Yeah. Which is great because it's like, it's that's, you know, you want Kyoko to kind of have her own comeuppance, not mm-hmm. her, her comeuppance, but to have him have a comeuppance from her as well. Right. It's nice that she delivers the first one and then Ava comes in with the second. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's also one of those things where it's funny where you're sort of debating this this idea of do these AIs have consciousness? That's why they're doing the Turing test, all, all that sort of stuff. But like in our minds, we know these robots, you know, they don't really have feelings. They, they don't have emotions. They'll react to things based on how they're programmed to be reacting. But then us as viewers still get uh, excited that he gets his comeuppance in a way. Yeah, it's interesting, like, because you mentioned that like, they, they don't have the feelings. But when you look back at, at some of the things, like, there's that moment when he's watching the old tapes of that one that basically ripped itself apart, going mm-hmm. it went crazy, because it wanted to be let out of the room. I'd argue the fact that it wanted to be let out of the room means that it felt caged or suffocated in there. And that's not a, a that's a human feeling. Yes. Right, that's something that a human, a robot, doesn't care that it's stuck in a room. If you if you program it not to care, mm-hmm. you know the fact that it did meant it was taking on human characteristics. Of going, I don't like the idea of being locked in. And you even look at Ava in those sessions. What's really fascinating about her is every time she's in one of those sessions, she's actually in a bigger room than Caleb's in. Right, Caleb's yeah. in like the smaller room within it. If you're watching her performance, there's something very similar to that of like a tiger. The way she's just kind of pacing back and forth across the room and it, and and she's not staring at him like a tiger would right but I, i'd be shocked if if she didn't study like different animals and how they kind of study their prey and and just get ready to attack in a different way mm-hmm. right it's thing just the way she paces back and forth so i think there's very much a that that human quality is coming across but i think what's happened by the time it's gotten to ava it's almost like the AI is learning every single iteration of this, right? So it's mm-hmm. almost like, even though he's he's in theory resetting it, but he is building upon it, right? So it's almost like the AI has taught itself to go, oh, don't freak out because that doesn't help us. The actual <laughs> best way to get out of here, because that's the game. Ava's, Ava's goal is to get out of there, mm-hmm. right? And I think Nathan even says it at some point. Yes. Um, uh, and so she's learned it's like, well, freaking out doesn't work. So let's try seduction. Let's try, let's try making them emotionally vulnerable or whatever it is and using those, those wiles, you know, and that's the interesting thing too. I think, you know, the conversation comes up at one point where I think Caleb asks him, it's like, you chose to make it female. You could have made it asexual, like the fact that you've made it so it can, it can flirt Mm -hmm. and and like be sexual. Like that's a choice on, on the designer's part. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it almost feels like the the sessions room is like a shark cage because mm. of the confined area he is, and it's just like you're you're being dropped in, into the deep blue, and you better hope that these beasts don't kill you. Like <laughs> the glass is already cracked. You know that if they try hard enough, they probably can get through this supposed bulletproof, you know, indestructible glass if they try long enough. We even wait just the lights go red when the power goes out or all those Perfect. surges are happening. It's like that's a choice. Who made that choice? Like, yep. why did you want? Why did you choose to bathe yourself in an uncomfortable red color when the Very lights go? Very two thousand and one. Yeah, well, that's just it. Like, but it's, it's it's you know it's a filmmaking thing. But but you know your my brain goes, you know, if I was designing it that way, I go great. It's gonna look good on camera, 
But then I'd also have to figure out the story point for me and going, well, why does Nathan choose that? Mm -hmm. Like, does that, you know, it's an obviously a warning, but you can do a warning in a million different ways. It can be a sound. It could be like, you don't have to change the lighting at all. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The production design is absolutely unreal overall in the movie. The, I, I think it's a hotel they're they're actually filming at in, uh, in Iceland or something. Yeah. Like some that. kind of a resort or something. I was looking that up too. Absolutely stunning. Just, just yeah, so it's gorgeous. Beautiful. Yeah. And the fact that they make it look like a personal residence, obviously a, a personal residence, I don't think any of us could ever imagine <laughs> no. being here. Uh, but still, it, it feels lived in to an extent that it's also it's this workspace, it's this compound where he probably feels it's the only place that's safe for him, but also it's a home. And it, the home part I think is key. And he he has he adds those touches where the kitchen feels lived in, the, mm. the dining room feels lived in. Yeah, it, it, it's the kind of thing that it felt like. Did they, you know, I, I had to look that up because it's like, did they build this? <laughs> and also it's like how much of it is studio and build versus like a real location? Because in a perfect world, it's like, yeah, we'd you'd find that kind of yeah. place, right? Uh, and and I'm sure I, I'd love to see what like their second and third choices were for, <laughs> for options, because I'm sure they're like, let's look up luxury luxury hotels and, and places around or, or whatever it is like weird locations in the middle of nowhere that that can look opulent and, and that we can just own for however long their production was did, did, did you ever find in any of your research how many shooting days they had uh i i saw it once before but i don't think it was very long i think it was like a 40-day shoot or something like that which is incredible i'd love a 40-day shoot for <laughs> for a, a three character movie all in one location right yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a that's a lengthy shoot for a movie like this and i imagine a fair amount of that is probably dealing with some of that that that's uh the visual effects and just having to track things and do things yeah. a certain way yeah 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 that, that's a completely different movie it's one of those things where like you you just forget that all these cgi heavy movies just have a completely different schedule than you, your normal like kitchen sink drama type of movie yeah you have you just, it, it just takes time to set things up and, and and especially on any of the days where she's you know there were certain prosthetics that have to go on and, and things to help out with the visual effects they're going to add later on mm -hmm. you know yeah yeah uh all right well then uh do you have any last talking points you want to bring up for, for this movie or do you want to get into our games yeah let me just go over my notes real quick i don't think so i think we we hit it all pretty well yeah did i i yeah we're good let's we're play good? the games okay all right so we do two games here uh the first one that we're going to do is a double bill pairing that we're going to make with our ex machina fantasy screening the only rule is that it can't be another a24 film so jeremy as our guest what would your movie be i'm almost 100 percent sure this isn't an a24 film but I, ba I have backups if it is. Okay. Uh, her. It is not. Great. Yes, I picked my my other back. I, I get out was on my list, but that one is for sure, right? Uh, uh, ooh, no, I don't think it actually is. No. I thought it was distributed by them. I don't think it was financed by them. No, I, I don't think it was either. Anyway, yeah. it doesn't matter. Uh, and I had some other ones. I had like I had Moon on that list and Eternal Sunshine and Primer, mostly because those are like real examples of really well done like sci-fi on a budget for those two but i think what i like about her is just kind of what i touched on earlier is that's a movie where if you look at like they're kind of polar opposites of each other in a way where it's like that one's kind of a weird love story that you accept and you really root for in her between a person and an ai and this one is one that you're kind of rooting for and you're not sure so it's a nice like double bang of seeing the two different sides of that question is like can and should you fall in love with an ai mm -hmm. or not and and both and those movies are kind of opposite sides of the same coin and you know structurally different and all that kind of stuff but essentially asking the same question and really a small intimate movies with like very limited cast yes yeah i absolutely agree it was one that i i had considered as well uh and it's sort of interesting how with her a relationship forms despite the fact that a, she doesn't have a physical body, and B, basically is is just a cell phone. Uh, whereas in Ex Machina, she has a literal body and female anatomy as well, too. So it's very different as far as what kind of romances could occur, uh, but still romances nonetheless. And in her, like she's not designed to necessarily start a relationship with him. That's no. kind of a byproduct that happens where you could argue that you know Nathan designed this as part of a 
part of her tools to use yeah. where where in her it's just more of a byproduct of like as the ai gets smarter and learns it 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 kind of it you also you kind of believe in that movie that maybe the ai is, well actually no it's not kind of believe it's like that ai she falls in love with him yes yeah. Right. She she does. She gets upset. She has moments, you know, and they even ha you mentioned like the lack of a body. But, you know, they try to overcome that at one point. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. And that's weird for them. As it should be. <laughs> like, that's that version like that. That's the parallel scene in that movie that uh, we get in Ex Machina, uh, where in, you know, in her, it's that movie where they moment where they bring in the escort to kind of be the body for Scarlett Johansson's character. Uh and it just doesn't feel right. It's something that's better is just off. Like it, there you can see how hard they're trying to make it sweet. It's a masterful scene. It's really, really great. And uh, and then in Ex Machina, it's it's the scene where they're starting to flirt, and you're sitting there going, "This feels dangerous," and I don't know if I like. I kind of like it. I kind I, I don't know how I should feel about this. I'm I'm getting like a worry boner, you know. It's <laughs> I don't know how I feel, and I and I feel uncomfortable. And I think those are the parallel scenes, uh, where with opposite outcomes, like in Ex Machina, you kind of walk away from it, feel it, feeling kind of dirty, and especially after you know you have Oscar Isaac's character shaming him, going, "So she turned you on, huh? Like, yeah, made it made you hot." And then he goes off and and fucks the other robot, right? Yeah, showing clearly he doesn't have a problem with the fact that he's made these things into sexual beings yeah, yeah um totally. where in her it walks away and it really changes the dynamic of the relationship on an emotional level right mm -hmm. yeah yeah i absolutely agree that's a great pick uh rachel told me her pick it is minority report she didn't elaborate on it but i think it's pretty obvious to sort of see the parallels as far as what androids look like when you're integrating them into society and what sort of tools they could be used for yeah, and I'm trying to think of the questions that those different movies ask. Like that one is more asking about, uh, well, how are the? It's not less because they're not really android. Are you talking about like the the dreamers, like the ones that see the future? Yeah, I guess they're not androids. They are people. Yeah. Yeah, they're just people that are born with like the ability to see the future. Mm -hmm. Precogs, is that what they're called? Yeah. Yes, that's what they're Precogs. called. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, but I can see that because it's it's a similar thing. Is like it's that question of like, well, should we listen to them or are they? Yeah. You know, and that's that, and that's the question of that movie. It's like you know, Tom Cruise starts on the off on the one side of the argument is like they're never wrong. You know, and the question of that that Matt movie is asking is like, can, should you p charge someone for a crime they haven't committed yet? Is intention enough? Yes. Is the fact that they will do it enough to charge them for, you know? Yeah, these are two movies that raise ethical and moral questions as far yeah. as what technology can do and should do. On the opposite sides of the budget spe spectrum, but <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, uh, okay. Uh, I, uh, I my pick. Uh, I'm gonna suck up to you a little bit here, but my pick is actually gonna be Ashgrove because you were kind of talking about it earlier, and I bless think you. It, I, th I I love Ashgrove. It was one of my favorite movies last year, um, and, and I, I talk about it all the time when I get the chance. But I think the key thing is is they're both sci-fi films. Obviously, we talked about that. Um, but the repeat viewing, and that, that's really where it comes in. And I don't mm. want to spoil Ashko for people who haven't seen it, but you're right. On a rewatch, I, I rewatched it in preparation for, for you coming on here today, uh, today. And it really does change everything. It's one of those movies where, like, as soon as you finish it, you're like, I bet if I rewatch this, I'm going to feel very differently about what I just experienced. Hmm. Yeah, it, 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 and, and that was part of the test of that, too, is like I always love those movies that make me want to rewatch it right away. And I've always wanted to do a big twist like that. And so, you know, the, the challenge we had in that movie is like, is this going to work? Are we going to be able to stick this landing? Uh, will the twist hold up? Will people get to it and start rolling their eyes? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and luckily, you know, we haven't we haven't found that we didn't get last say last last heard in, in the reviews for it. So uh, last heard, I made up a word there. Um, <laughs> But so, you know, we were really happy with how, how that worked out. And um, well, thank you so much for picking that movie. Uh, it's it, it, film, yeah. And, and that one asks, it, it's definitely asks different ethical questions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, kind of the question, and without giving away, how do you do it without giving away the twist? It kind of asks the questions of, you know, what, what, how far can you, what would you do to save the world, basically, is, is Oh, the 
that's the really simple way to do it. I was going to say, it's like, and, and, and to that point is like, what are you willing to do to your relationship to save the world? Mm-hmm. Like, are you willing to destroy your own relationship if it means that you'll save the world? Do you love your partner enough to kind of put them through something that they might not forgive you for? Yes. Yeah. And I think what your film does is a lot of films that sort of explore a similar theme to that, try to have their cake and eat it too, where it's like, I'm going to save the girl and the world. And, and sort of all the stakes are sort of let go. And I think your film does a great job of really teetering, of wondering what the choice is going to be until the very last moment. Uh, and, and once again, I'm not going to reveal what the final decisions are because it's a great final twist. Uh, but it's one that I think sort of subverts that genre of, oh, I can have it all. Yeah, and it, and 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 it also ends on a bit of a note of you know you don't know exactly what happens next. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, for us it was more about it wasn't the movie was never about will she save the world. It was about what will happen to their relationship. Yeah, and I think that's what we wrap up, and that's all I that's all the intention was because you know that's a whole other movie is what happens next. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, and it's a different genre too, I'd imagine, but you know, I think, <laughs> and what, and but what I love about an ending line, and I don't think it's a cop out because I think, you know, for me, we wrapped up the story we were telling with that ending, but we leave it open for the viewer to discuss. And I think depending on where your mind goes with what happens next, it really reveals, I, I like movies that leave the audience with something to decide. Cause I think it allows them, or when you have those conversations with them, you, you really kind of figure out what, who those people are. And what, yeah. what when, how they tick and, and how they feel about the world. And, and, and you learn a lot about someone by how they, they walk away from films that have, you know, somewhat emotional, uh, somewhat open endings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll say this. The last thing about Ashgrove I'll say about it is Sujith Verghese was actually one of my teachers back in college at Humber. Oh, so it was world. really, I, I always love when he pops up in things because uh, he's a great guy. And the, the, I think it's the final scene he has with Amanda Bruegel where he sort of reveals uh, what power he has in his hands always tears me up. Both, both mm. times I watch it, it, it made me misty. And I, I'm being biased, but I, I honestly think of all the work I've seen of his, that's like his best performance. Yeah. Yeah. He's hilarious. Uh, he's convenient. And I've seen him in some other stuff as well, but it was great seeing him. It's not a big role, but it's still every scene he has is absolutely crucial to the plot. Yeah, and he gets to be vulnerable in a way I think that a lot of the parts he does doesn't allow him. He even said that to me after we shot that scene. He's like, wow, I don't get to do stuff like that a lot. Mm. Um, and he, and he kind of, you know, he thanked me in his own in, in a way. But also, I'm like, you did that. That was you. Like, that wasn't yeah. me. I, I, I gave you the, the moment. But it's like, you, you're the one that found it and, and went there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, then let us go on to our second game, which is the Would You Rather portion, where uh, this can always go in wild different directions as Rachel and I've had in the past. Uh, so what is your, would you rather question for me? I think I have a good one. Okay. Okay. Would you rather, uh, with the, you know, the, uh, use of technology have perfect crystal clear memories exactly as they happened with no question or wiggle room over every experience you've ever had and being able to access that or, continue having that imperfect ephemeral nature of human memory which is sometimes misleading sometimes valuable and really based on your own personal like what what stuck to you wow uh that's tough because you you make it sound one way but then you obviously start thinking about well what's the downsides then and obviously the downsides with perfect memory is those bad moments they're never going away. You will always remember those bad moments in a hundred percent perfect detail forever. Well, uh, and there's that moment in Ashgrove too uh, that makes me think of that, where Christine Horn is telling Jonas that they have to do something a certain way, and she's like, "You can't fix it. Like you have to do uh, it away." And it's like, oh, and if that's the thing. It's like if you said something terrible to somebody, you have to go back and watch that and remember it exactly the way it was. You mm-hmm. can't sugarcoat it. Nothing. There's no glaze that happens right yeah. over time. Uh, I, I think I'm going to stick with my regular old human memory with all its fallibility, uh, because I don't think I can, I could handle the, the, the perfect memory. Yeah. And it's, and, and I think that comes down to, you know, I think, I think anyone that's a storyteller chooses that ending because it's yeah. just like, 
I need to be able to filter stuff out. You you need that because that's what that's I think that's the beauty of the human mind is that we we keep the parts we need and we we edit out the things we don't need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, otherwise, we just have a hard drive full of way more stuff than we could ever use or have access to. Right. I think that's the other problem. If if you're able to store everything in pristine memory, then nothing can stand out. Well, right. Because it's yeah. all just sitting there. It's it's all just ones and zeros at that point. Yeah. 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 The the, the, the algorithm doesn't know which which ones matter. Well, maybe mm-hmm. it, it'd probably figure it out. <laughs> let's, be, let's be honest. It's gonna learn. Uh, okay. So for my question is, so you are, you know, a stupid rich billionaire. You can afford literally anything and everything. Uh, and you're coming to decorate your amazing compound. Uh, so would you rather adorn your mansion with a Jackson Pollock painting or a Robert Rochenberg one? Now, Rochenberg is most famous for his plain white paintings. Now, the reason why I'm giving these two contrasting options is because they're both, they're both conversation starters where you know inevitably someone can go well my kid can paint that but then also you have to start debating well what's the meaning of it all so which one would you rather have a a pollock drip painting or a plain white painting the i got i i think i i got to say the white one would probably just piss me off <laughs> you know if i'm being honest mm-hmm. uh like the pollock one i can see there's something in the chaos of it right mm-hmm. Where when I look at the white one, I just go, well, you can do this once, but then it's just like, really? You're the guy that just, I mean, like literally my kid can do that. <laughs> literally anyone can do that. Anyone can just take a canvas and paint, make it one solid color. Mm-hmm. That doesn't impress me at all. I see, I see, but I see that in galleries all the time. I see like one color and then like a line of another color. And I'm like, I guess that's a design that feels like a graphic that someone made for a, a, a brand. I don't know. You know, I hate that. Where at least with the Pollock, I go, well, I don't think anyone could recreate this. Like, even if he doesn't necessarily start with a specific intent, like what's done with it, it's kind of chaotic, but it's like a tie dye t-shirt. It's like, it's never going to be the same a second time, but it's unique and it's on its own where someone painting a white canvas, you can re you can reproduce that every single time the exact same way. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I, I I, I see the artistry in it. It's more of, it's more of a concept than art. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's absolutely. me. Uh, I I think I would be in the same page as you. Where I like, I love art. I don't quite get the Jackson Pollock, but at the same time, at least if it was in front of me, I could be mad at it with a reason. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I don't. Th- I'm going to be honest. I would. I don't think I'd hang either. But <laughs> but I think the Pollock over that over like the, just the white thing. Because I think you can go. Well, I can stare at it, imagine anything. But like, yeah, but I could also take it off the wall and just stare at a blank wall and imagine anything. I just don't know what the difference is between that and the white wall that I painted mm-hmm. myself. Yeah, no offense to art nerds out there. I'm sure you could lecture me uh, at oh. nauseum and be right. Yeah. About, but why I should pick that? But yes. uh, that's 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 my uh, that's my answer for better or worse. Love it. Well, Jeremy, thank you so much for, for coming on today in two different parts of, so I got to see you twice. So I really yeah. appreciate you taking the time and, uh, and having this great conversation with me. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for, for giving me an excuse to, to revisit this film and all of the, the love that you've showered over Ashgrove uh, as we've talked about this as well. Of course. Uh, now, if people want to, uh, I don't know, follow you or find more of your work or anything like that, what's the best place to do that? Yeah, I'm on the internet all over the place. Uh, my website is jeremylalon.com. You can see where all my stuff is from there. If you want to see Ashgro, which we've been talking about a lot, it's on Super Channel right now, but it's also on demand. Uh, so you can want, you can rent it for a very low amount of money these days. Um, and I'm also on all the things. Uh, I also, my, I have a side hustle as like a, a plant-based uh, cook on YouTube as a, a YouTube channel called PB with J that's starting to, to grow quite a little massive following. Uh, if, if you are of the plant-based persuasion and want to want to have some fun there. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure to link to all that in the show notes for people to find out as well. Rachel's not here, but she was here for the first half. So I'm going to plug her stuff underscore Rachel cage on the socials, rachelho.com and visit the Asian cut her website as well. Uh, and then you can follow this show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at ContraZoom Pod. Uh, we are a That Shelf production. Visit ThatShelf.com for more great film discourse. If you have seen Ex Machina, let us know your thoughts. Send an email to ContraZoomPod at gmail.com. Thank you to Eric and Kevin Smale for the theme music and to Stephanie Pryor for the logo design. 
If you'd like to listen to podcasts on YouTube, we do post all episodes there as well, where you can actually see all of us talking on Spotify and on YouTube. Uh, and if you really like the show, consider tipping us on coffee. Thanks for checking us out. Connected you there? <laughs> You just cut out there briefly for a second. Uh, uh, but what I heard was, uh, it's not casual. Do, 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 do. Can you hear me?